How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody excited to be here? I'm excited to be here. God is amazing, right? So I'm going to be, uh, so if you don't know me, my name is Matt. I'm one of, one of the many who's blessed enough to uh, be able to serve the youth here at Awaken. Um, if you do know me, I'm sorry. That's right. Yeah, if, are there any youth here? Let's. Yeah! Like two, that's cool. We'll work, we'll work on that. So tonight I was gonna uh, we're gonna pray for the offering and get into that, but I wanted to give you guys a kind of a visual, you know, something God showed me a couple years ago that I think is just amazing. It had an amazing impact on my life and and what I understood. So I'm gonna we're gonna do this here today. So I've asked Tristan to come up here and help me. So everyone give Tristan a round. All right. So Tristan, so so do you have any change in your pocket? No. All right. Well, I think I got I got a little bit. So here you take that. Okay. Uh, here. So this is this is a uh, this is like what God's given him. Okay, this is so I want you to hold on to that as tight as you can. And don't let go. Whatever happens. Okay. So see where we're at in that uh, on the screen there. So we're today we're at a Malachi and what it says in Malachi three verse ten. It says, "Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this," says God. Test me in this. This is like the the only time that God says to test him in something, and is this. And see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. I mean, that's amazing, okay? So you see, so see what the the problem God's saying is that, you know, you can keep on, you can hold on to this. But the problem is, if if you're holding on to that, you know, I want to pour into your life. I want to, you know, use you as a conduit, you know, and pour into your life all these blessings. But if you're holding on to what's mine... If you're holding on to what's mine, you know, I, I can't I can't seem to do it. Right? So, so long that one. So what happens is if, is if we decide to give it to God, so give it. So, so, oh, no, drop. There you go. Now hold your hand out. So you give it, and then see God can start pouring in your hand, right? He can start pouring stuff in your hand, he can start pouring life, he can start pouring hope, he can start pouring blessings in your life. Now give it. Now see, you don't understand how many coins I brought tonight. So this is God, so go ahead, give it. Give it, just drop it. Give it, give it to God, and see, he'll fill it. And give it, and he'll fill it. And give it, and he'll fill it. Now both hands, now both hands, now both hands, now both hands. See, he'll fill it, he'll fill it, he'll fill it, and I'll give it. Now he'll fill it, and he'll fill it more, and he'll fill it more, and he'll fill it more, and I'll give it. And see, he'll fill it with not only not only finances, but he'll fill it with, with joy, with happiness. He'll fill it with peace. He'll fill it with all that stuff. Now give it. Now this is what God's saying. He's saying, test me in this, that I will... And test me and see that I'm going to open up the floodgates of heaven and fill your life with so many blessings that you can't even handle it. It's going to be amazing. You guys pumped? All right, I'm pumped too. Let's pray real quick. God, we thank you for just everything you've blessed us within our lives, God. We just, you're amazing. We pray that you would just be opening our hearts tonight, just just shaping us and, and letting us lean into you more, Lord. Build our faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so all the tithing buckets are on this side, my right side, your left side. So if you want to go ahead and just start passing those over. And I think that's it. So uh, check out the video. What's up, everybody? Woo! Well, today you get the thunder and the lightning. Yeah. Today is the unknown service where we make radical comments and later people treat us bad and some people 
Trude is nice. No, I'm just joking. It's going to be awesome tonight. Um, and so I want to pray for tonight. And thank you, Jaramillo, Matt Jaramillo, for dumping all this beautiful silver up here. Yeah, thank you, Lord. You've blessed us. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for all these questions that so many people in our, in our church have brought to us, God. Thank you that, um, that I get to be here with Falake, Lord. We get to answer your questions, Lord. Remove us from this conversation. Father, we just ask that, you, that we answer these questions the way you want us to answer. And Father, I thank you for that blue marshmallow up on stage, God. Just thank you that some people are going to get dunked today. Um, thank you for the Huskies winning. And thank you that now... Falake is a Husky fan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I think he wishes I'm not a Husky fan or the Seahawks fan. Wow. Well, welcome, everybody, to Awaken. If this is your first time, we want to say welcome. Can we give a shout for Jesus in the house? Now, one, one of the things you might wonder, what is the pastor doing on stage with the straggy evangelist that's next to him? We are here to answer some crazy questions that you guys have been asking. She said it, not me, <laughs> by the way. And we're really excited. And these questions, I want to say, we, we ask the Holy Spirit every day. But we don't want you to take our word for it. We want you to go back home, open up your Bibles, and ask God to confirm it. Because God is alive and he speaks. So we are not a church where you, you take our word for it alone. The Bible talks about the Bereans. After the message was spoken, they went back to check it. And we're a church where you can come and tell the pastor, hey, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't get that. So the first question I am going to be throwing at Daniel is, Daniel, people says, I'm a good person. I tithe. I, I love the poor and everything. Why do I need a savior? What is sin? Is Jesus the only way? What about other religion? Yeah, yeah. So, um, by the way, in softball league, this is the answer to everybody's faith. Like, why, why don't you go to church? Like, well, I'm a good person. And I'm thinking, man, is it just me that feels uh, messed up? In fact, uh, somebody asked uh, what church they go to, and they said, Awaken. And then somebody, their response is, oh, that's the church for sinners. Which is implying that there is good people, and then there's sinners. And so, um, in fact, many people, I think, that are in church that would say, oh, how dare people, you know, I'm a sinner. But maybe even the way you live your life um, separates God from, from maybe, or uh, that you need God. It, it, it's not easy to see. And so I want to start off with a quote from Erwin McManus. It's, it's so awesome. Um, it's a, he said this, how is it that for many of us, being a good Christian is nothing more than being a good person? I want to stop. Is that not it, right? I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I, I'm trying to be good. I don't sin. I don't do anything, right? But, but it goes on. It says, the entire focus of our faith has been the elimination of sin, which is important but inadequate. Rather than unleashing the unleashing of a unique, original, extraordinary, wonderful, untamed faith. I think, I think when people are saying they're good, they're, it's... We're, us at Awaken are in a totally another conversation. It's not about us, it's about Jesus. And when I take my life and I look at Jesus, I go, oh my gosh, I, I need help. But I think if I took my life and I said, well, if it's up to my standards and I'm, and I'm making my own standards, then I'm a good person. Thank you, honey. Well, it's all right. Let's wait for my wife. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I think, I think it's a relevant question, though. Am I a good person? Am I a good person? So let me just go to the Bible. We got some WikiLeaks in the Bible we can read. Um, uh, one of my favorite WikiLeaks is 1 Timothy 1.15. He did not want this to get out, by the way. 1 Timothy 1.15. He says this. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. What he's saying is important. Guys, this is just the truth. I mean, this is the reality. And then he says this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, go get them. They're sinners. But then it goes on and he says, and I am the worst of them all. WikiLeaks, it works. Guess what? Paul 
If you open up the New Testament, he's saying, I'm the worst of them all. Jesus came for me. When I look at Jesus and I look, look into my own life, he came for me because I'm broken. And I want to say this, people that think they're good scare me because I kid you not, people that are good got divorced and their kid just talk to their kids and ask them if they're good. I, I mean, people that, that, that talk about being good look into their life. People that talk about being a sinner that's saved by Jesus is putting all of the glory onto God. Anything great you see in my life, it's because of Jesus in my life. But all the rest of it, let's just be honest, I struggle to wake up in the morning and follow Jesus with all my heart. So, so I have a bunch of other verses here. Um, but I'm just going to tell you personally, I'm not a good person. I, I struggle a lot with following God's voice. And he speaks to me all the time, and I don't like to do it. And I struggle with saying what he wants me to say. And I struggle with leading as a pastor. And I struggle with so many things. But Jesus is the good one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short. You have a Bible under your chairs if you ever want to open it up. Um, but we're going to have to blow through some of these. But Matthew 19.13, I've not come for the righteous, but the sinners. Mark 27.17, Jesus didn't come for the healthy, but the sick. And it says, not the, not the righteous, but the sinners. Um, Luke uh, 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Romans 5.6, at the right time, Jesus died for us sinners. And I just think it goes on and on in the Bible. And if you read the Bible, what you will get, starting with the New Testament or the Old Testament, is people are messed up and they need a Savior, and God comes in and rescues the day. And so if you're here today and you think that you're a good person, if, if you compare yourself to Jesus Christ, I think you will find that you need a Savior, that you need to be like Him, and that that's where we find life is in Jesus, not in our own personal opinions. Or, or, or ways. And, and just to finish, I just want to finish with this, this, that so many people are choosing bad visions and strange truths. And they're, they're, they're making that the focus. So many people are, are saying that they're good. They're, they're, they're making um, the culture and what the internet says and what people say about presidential people and, and, and different people. And you're making this the focus, not what the Bible says and what God says. And when you open up the Bible, it starts reading you and you start to get convicted. And that's just the reality of it. Because the Bible is not written to perfect people. And if you're a church person that goes to a perfect church, then you don't need the Bible. The Bible was written for sinners. And the Bible, when we read it, is to point us to the fact that we need to be saved. And I think that's so awesome. I found that in Jesus Christ. And, and so... That's my rough answer. Wow. Well, which, by the way, I want to go, this is going to be the most awkward question ever, but I, I love this question. What is the role of a woman in the church? Woo! Yeah. Other than, like, we don't have any washing machines or dishes. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Ross, that didn't work. You're wrong. No. I actually love that question. I do. Because I, I want to say this. Everywhere I go, I hear... I actually had an experience in Waterville. I was invited to come and speak in Waterville. And a bunch of pastors, they brought, their, um, they brought signs and said, don't go there, it's a woman speaking. It was the greatest publicity I ever had because everybody came. So let me, I, I, and I might offend some of you with my answer, but I'm going to start with the book of Acts 2, verse 17. It says in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, your sons and your grandsons. No, your sons and will prophesy. Your young men will see vision and your old men will dream dreams. And when God says that in the last days, we live in the last days, but the Bible always interprets the Bible. So a couple of people read the book of 1 Timothy and it says women should not speak. But if you read the whole chapter, it also says um, men should lift up their hands. I don't see all the men lifting up their hands. It says women should not dress in expensive clothes. Uh, why are we not majoring on that? It says women should not wear earrings or pearls. Men for, take notes. Yeah. <laughs> but for some reason, when a woman gets up to use the gift that God has given her, we have a problem with it. And most of the time, the people that say so, they're doing nothing for the gospel. 
And I, you know what I love? God could use a donkey to speak in the Bible. I'm a donkey for Jesus Christ. And I'll never stop speaking. I'll never stop. Because it's a gift that in awakening, thank God for the leadership we have. We have amazing women in this church. Look at this service. It was organized by a, a group of people called programmers. I don't know how to put a service like this together. But what if we told them we don't need your gift because you're a woman. You need to stay home and cook and clean and wear your apron. Hello, the gospel has to be spoken. And God says in the last day, I'll pour my spirit upon your sons and your daughters. I have a young um, niece here, Kamaya. She wants to be a preacher one day. I'm never going to tell her you can't preach. I say, go for it. Preach the gospel everywhere you go. And I want to say my daughters are going to preach. And the thing about it is that in the Bible, let's look at the Old Testament, Judges 4, 4 to 5. Deborah, the wife of, whoo, that's a hard name, Laporath, God forgive me. She was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites will go to her for judgment. It didn't say the women will go to her. It said all Israel will come to her. God raised a woman to be the judge of the Israelites. Another scripture that I have for you is one of my favorites. What do we do about the evangelists? John 4, 39-42. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he's indeed the savior of the world. Can I, can I show you that in the Bible, the first evangelist was a woman of Samaria. And then I have one more, John 2017, and I'm going to end with this one. This is after Jesus had resurrected. Now he had a new message. He commissioned a woman to go and tell the disciples that God is no longer his God, but he has become our God. That God is no longer his father, but he has become our father. And this is what he says. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the father. But go find my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Can I tell you something? When I preach... I don't preach because I need a platform. I got saved in Africa. I didn't need to stand on the stage. I preached at the, at the corner. I, I preached in buses because I could not hide what Jesus Christ has done for me. And when women speak, when women speak, I want to say this to you. We cannot hide the good news of Jesus Christ because we were sinners. We were messed up. But one day he came for us and changed our position. We will not be silent. Now, can I say this? There's order. And this is the order. I submit to my husband. I'm not going to do ministry with my house falling apart. I submit to the pastor of this church because God has not called us to cause division and gossip in the church. But other than that, there's an order, and this is the order. God first, my family second, and the last is ministry. And in that order, we proclaim the name of Jesus. So can I say this to you women that are sitting in this place today? You've heard the scripture, women are not allowed to speak. You've heard the scripture that women are only allowed to stay at home and cook bonbons and all those things. I have experienced Jesus Christ, and he's alive. And when I got saved, he told me, go and tell the world what I have done for you. And I will not stop doing it. And I'm, I'm willing to get to heaven and say, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I, I, I could not stop talking about you than to say, Jesus, I am sorry. I believed them, so I kept silent. I'm, really, I'm willing to ask for forgiveness on the last day. So, Daniel, does that answer your question? So I guess men don't need to be in the church at all. <laughs> How about the men up in here? They're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, Daniel, I have a question for you. This one is a crazy one because I don't understand this. So I hope you, you clear that for us. 
because you always say we're not in, we're a non-denominational church. So my question for you is, what are denominations anyway, and why is Awakening not a denominational church? Yeah, yeah. well, first, before I even jump into that, a guy wrote me that, that came to our church, and he said that, that the Holy Spirit was grieved, that Falake was speaking at our church, and that the Lord has judged me personally. It's this long email of how mad God was personally at me because Falake is a minister in our church. And again, I'll just say this one more time, but um, God doesn't care what you pee out of. He cares of, about your heart. That's just the reality of it. And that's what I wrote him. And I also said the next time you write something like this, there's going to be a restraining order But because um, you're crazy. But um, but I think it's awesome that, that what Falake does, and, and I think it's awesome that um, my little daughter can minister to, to anybody, and God can use anybody. And uh, but, but back to Falake's question about what are denominations. And, you know, let me tell you, for one, why we're a non-denominational church. Because when we started the church, I felt like God said to me, don't let anybody tell you where to go because I'm going to call you somewhere and you're just going to have to go. And it was really hard because we didn't have any money and we didn't have anything. And so I remember think like freaking out thinking, we could get money. If we, we, in fact, now, if we decided to join a denomination, they would give us money. And they give us money to join them, and they give us money to help plant. But we chose the hard road for the, for, for the sake of freedom. And uh, in the process of, of, of making this choice, um, uh, it, it was really hard. We, it, it's, like, it's like when you get free money, but free money comes at a cost. We, don't, we, we didn't take the free money. And no one can tell us where to go. But let me tell you, it was so hard to not accept or to get any outside funds, to not have a building. When we came into the building, um, we just went for it. Me and Jess wrote a check from our own personal account and paid for the building for a while until we could make it. And, and uh, we're, we're a non-denominational church because we believe that, that our vision is too big to fit in any of the denominations that we know of. And so we're going to live that way. And, um, and um, when we started this church, my dad was a part of the Nazarene denomination. He paid $400,000 to get out of the Nazarene denomination, if that says anything to you about my family's role in denominations. But, um, but let me say this. Uh, there, there are a couple issues with denominational churches, and I think there's some amazing things. And one of, one of the things is we're not a church that's here to judge other churches. That's not our thing. Um, we're connected with many pastors in, in, in the town and whatever. But, but let, me, let me just bring out some issues, and you might know some of the places that, that are like this. But, but here's some churches, some denominations that we would, we, would, we would have issues with. The one is a church that lifts up one gift. If a denominational church lifts up one gift, like, for instance, I'm a pastor. I'm the highest up. And you guys, you know, and so you lift one gift up. Some churches, it could be giving. Some churches, it could be tongues and the Holy Spirit. In fact, some church, I've had guys tell me I'm going to hell because I don't speak in tongues. And trust me, I have tried. <laughs> one time, Falake had this guy pray over me, and it was laughing tongues. And I was like, Lord, if you give me tongues, that's what I want. <laughs> Because it was wonderful. <laughs> but but it's, it's the fact that people lift up one gift. Um, and 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31 talks all about that. But the, but the other one is the underemphasis of evangelism. How, I see so many denominational churches that are all about surviving. And there's absolutely no immediacy to people knowing Jesus or baptism or, or people being invited or even a call for them to give their life to Jesus. Now, I'm not here to call them out, but I would say that's a huge issue in, in, in the church world um, and the fact that we will not be like that. Uh, I, I think the other one is, is truth without love. There's churches that just blatantly say, you're going to hell because you haven't given your life to Jesus. That's the truth, but it's not true because it's not in love. So it's actually a lie. That's not the conversation that God is having with everybody in this room. God is having the conversation of, I sent my one and only son to die on the cross for you because I love you, because you matter, and you're going to become something great. And I've planned things long before you were born. But, but, but in that, 
I, there's churches that just want to throw truth. And then they say, oh, we're all about the Bible and we're true. But it, the Bible says it, truth in love. Truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. How about this? Churches, church discipline with no forgiveness. Oh, you got married? You're kicked out of the church. Well, where does that fit with Jesus' life? There's discipline with, without somebody actually walking with someone in forgiveness. There's no forgiveness. It's just black and white discipline. It's just, just how it is. Sorry. You're out. You messed up. How about the opposite? I think the opposite would be huge. It would be a church with no discipline and an overemphasis on forgiveness. Hey, you can do whatever. It's fine. We just forgive you. Well, let me tell you, we've had many hard talks in this church, and we don't have it when you give your life to Jesus. Trust me. I mean, we understand that you give your life to Jesus, and, and it's really rough, and, and you're just you're trying to follow him, but you realize your life and the Bible don't match up. But later on down the road, we have to have that talk. Dude, the prescription drugs have got to go. Because you're, you're, you're crazy. And if we get these things out, I think something great. Hey, you know what? you got to stop living with your girlfriend. The Bible is clear about this. We, we start laying these things out. And let me tell you, people respond not in, in like, oh, how dare you? They respond in, I didn't know. Some of them go, well, I knew, but no one ever really said anything. Some people respond by saying, the church hurt me, and they're out. But, but let me tell you this. We are going to be a church that has discipline, but it's not the first thing that we do. But we're also not going to lack discipline in the fact of people that need their lives to, to, to move towards Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, so those are huge, huge issues. But, but here's another one. The focus on uni unity at the expense of truth or integrity. This is huge. Churches all around say they want to be unified, but their unity unify like to unify, it's at the expense of our own truth and our own beliefs. And I would say this, I would say this, that, that there are so many different churches out there, but but the reason that you should go to a church, I think first and foremost, is what does the Bible say? And, and and, and go and be a part of a church that's all about the Bible. But the, but the next thing that I think is huge is, is um, pray about it. Talk to God. Don't just go to a church. Be the church. Be what God wants you to be. Jump all in. Throw your life into it. When you're reading the scriptures, call, call me up or flock it. I found this in the scriptures. Let's go do it. I think that is that is the essence of our church, and, and, and uh, I think we will always take the harder road, not because, because um, of any other reason than there's a blessing that comes through the pain. I think we'll, we'll always have a bigger vision. We have a vision of 32,000 people. That's the whole entire town coming to our church. That's our vision. It's going to happen. Amen. I, I, we have a go wherever God calls us to go. If God, when God calls us to Chelan, we're going to go. No, we're, there's no group of people that get to say, oh, well, you have to pay us a evangelism tax for Chelan through our denomination. We, we're going to go. And, and also, I want to say this. We give 10% of our church's income, and we give it away. We don't give it to a denomination that's trying to maintain. We give it to people that are moving and advancing the kingdom of Christ. And so, I don't know if I answered that question but fully, but I, I'll say this. We're not going to lift up one gift. We're going to lift up all the gifts. We're going to focus on what God wants us to do. We're going to go where he's called us to do. We're not going to worry about anything else. So, yeah. So, Falake. Wow. wow, that was awesome. This is my favorite question of all tonight. Yeah. Um, I, I, so, so, you speak in tongues. Yes, I do. Believe it or not. If explain <laughs> to us, explain to us, uh, a lot of people here, um, uh, tongues and, and your, your personal prayer language mm -hmm. and how that, how that plays a role in your life and in the church. And uh, just go for it. Just go buck wild on that whole thing. Wow. Hello. I feel like you guys have heard the secret, the hidden gift. I want to talk about speaking in tongues because Daniel did say that I really want, I've been praying for him to get the gift too. And he's going to get it one of these days. I got saved in Nigeria. It was radical. 
I didn't get saved like uh, um, what we do here and everything. Actually, it was so radical. It was almost like God came in. I could not deny the existence of God. I would even call it supernatural. But when I got saved, it was so real. I was hungry and thirsty. Everything I read in the Bible, I'll go to God and say, God, if this is in the Bible, I want it. Bam, he gives it to me. Oh, yeah. I remember one time I was, I was reading the Bible about demons and deliverance. I was like, whoa, this is awesome. So God, if there's a possessed person out there, show them to me. Sure enough, I met somebody, oh, cast out the demon, and wow, the power of God is real. So one day, I went to church, and I saw a group of people singing in the spirit. It was so beautiful. And I went home, and I was hungry. I said, God, what was that? And God said, it's the gift of tongues. And I'm like, when were you going to tell me about this? <laughs> I'm like, I want it. And then God started teaching me about the gifts of tongues. And I think the Bible should interpret itself because we don't want to speak. I have the experience, but God doesn't want me to just tell you my experience. He wants it backed up with his word. So the first thing God showed me was in Acts 2 from 1 to 4. The first time the gift of tongues ever appeared. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. That was the first time it appeared. Then the second time, this was to the Jewish disciples. Well, the second time it appeared was to the Gentiles in Acts 10, 44, um, from 10, 44 to 46. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. So first to the, to the Jewish people who were disciples, second to the Gentiles. So I knew I qualified because I was a Gentile. Then the last time it came was in Acts 19, verse 1 to 7. This was to believers. While Apollos was in um, Corinth, um, Corinth oh, I can't read that. Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior region until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several, who are they? They were believers. Then he, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? He asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. Then what bat baptism did you experience? He asked, and they replied, the baptism of John. Then Paul said, John baptized, uh, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Whoa, when I read that, I was like, okay, God, I've seen it in the Bible. Now I want it. And I'll never forget that day. I was just in my room alone. I didn't go to a pastor. I didn't go to anybody. And I just said, God, if this is from you, I want the gift. And I began to worship. And all of a sudden, there was a wind in my room. And I began to s sing in English. But then suddenly I stopped. I was like, whoa, what is that? And my language had changed. And I've been praying in the spirit since then. Why, do, why did God give this gift? God gave the gift because... I don't know how to pray for you in English because I'm limited. I could say in the morning, God, um, I want you to bless Ross. I want you to protect Ross. I want you to go with Ross. I want you to, then I stop because I, I'm limited in my language. But the Spirit helps us to pray in such a way because he sees what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. And then when you begin to pray, the Holy Spirit is praying with your spirit connected to God. And then you begin to pray for something that the enemy has already planned that you didn't know, they didn't know, but the Holy Spirit knows. And he uses you to pray for the person. And in the scriptures, in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, this is what it says. This is Paul. He says, for you have the ability to speak in tongues. 
you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it, but it will all be mysteries. So that was what the Holy Spirit said to me, that it will be mi mi um, mysteries. So there are four kinds of tongues, and I'm going to run through them really quickly. First, tongues are for a sign for unbelievers. Tongues are for a sign for unbelievers. There was a story of a pastor, Pastor Paul Yonggi Cho. He went to a different country, and he did not have his interpreter because the interpreter was running late. And he said, God, what do I do? And God said, pray in tongues. And as he was praying, suddenly, after he finished, people started coming to get saved. And he said, what's going on? And somebody said, you just preached the gospel. He was like, I don't even understand the language. But the Holy Spirit knew. So the first sign is tongues are for a sign, and that is from um, 1 Corinthians 14, 22. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is, the, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. The second um, tongues is tongues are um, for interpretation. When you speak in tongues... Paul says, don't do it in the church, because Daniel also asked me, why is it that we don't, at Awaken, we don't emphasize tongues? Well, if you walked in here, and you saw me, and I'm like, gibberish, cha -cha 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 -cha. don't you think you think I'm crazy? <laughs> this order, there is order, because he says, when you speak in tongues, you have to have an interpreter. So anyone who speaks in tongues, you pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. So you'll be a mad person if you just come here and you're speaking in tongues. It's just about you. It's not edifying the church. The next one is um, tongues for personal prayer. 1 Corinthians 14. That's the one I described to you. That I don't know how to pray for you, so I need the help of the Holy Spirit. For I pray in tongues. My spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. So this is for, my, for myself, for praying to edify me. And the last one is um, tongues are for intercession. Romans 8, 26 to 27. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all our heart knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Tongues are for intercessors. When you're praying for people, you need the ability of the Holy Spirit to pray in tongues. So what am I saying? Do all speak in tongues? Does that mean if you don't speak in tongues, you're not going to heaven? That's, that's not what it means. It's just like when you go to Dutch Brothers and you get 10 free stamps. And then you know you get a free one. And you say, ah, I'm just going to throw my card away. I'm like, no way. I'm going to get my free automaker. Why? What does that mean? Jesus paid the price and he gave us a gift. But if you don't want it, if you're not hungry for it, it doesn't disqualify you. Going to heaven is a free gift. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But I'm the kind of person that I want everything that the cross has bought for me. So if it's in the Bible, I'm going to chase after it. I'm going to chase and follow it. So I want to say this. You might hear people say, if you don't speak in tongues, you're going to hell. That is baloney. It's not in the Bible. If you don't speak in tongues, speak. Pray in your English. Pray in the language you know but when you come around me get ready because I will pray in tongues at my house but I will not do it up here because sometimes it leads to confusion it's we're not majoring on that we are majoring on Jesus Christ in this house so I hope that answered your question yeah he's been dying to look at your neighbor and say Honda should have bought a Chevy <laughs> <laughs> just joking well I, I have one for you Daniel Oh, wow. We, we are running out of time. Do you think I can give you one more question? We have two here. Would you like to? We, we are at 805, so. Go for it. Okay. Keep going. Oh, somebody said keep going. Wow. <laughs> so, Daniel, what's your stance on using alcohol or prescription pills? Well, it helps me with my flag dancing. <laughs> um, I have a great flag dancing team. Um, you know, <laughs> You know, I, I want to say that we're just, we're just going to go here real quick, but I'll say this. I have, I have two friends, three friends, four, man, a lot of friends, actually, um, that, that have been a part of prescription pills, taking prescription pills. And one of the things that every one of my friends have taken, uh, it said that's taken them is, is I should never take these. And then just recently, I've had a few friends that started taking them through, through pain reasons. 
And I watched their life and their family and their marriage and everything start falling apart. And I want to say this, um, that if you're here today and you're taking pain medication, I want to speak to you what I spoke to them. Pain is a sign of something broken that needs to be fixed. Now, if you're just in constant pain 24-7, I, I would just want to encourage you. Pain is not the end of the world, but losing your life to drugs is. And to watch people like, uh, there's a uh, singer out there called NF. Listen to the song that he wrote about his mom who killed herself on pain medication. It's heartbreaking. You know, um, I, my encouragement to one of the, the, my friends was, go through the pain. Stop medicating the pain. Go through the pain. Start praying. Start being hungry for what God's going to do. Now, I know that, that some people have to go there, and, but, but I'm telling you, if our church and if people in our town would start to stop taking, you know, st stop medicating pain and start dealing with pain. How about alcoholics? A lot of alcoholics, I know some in here today that are clean and sober for quite a while. Let's give a hand for those guys that are in here. That have, Okay. And if you're here, you drink alcohol. I'm not here to say, hey, the Bible says don't drink. But let me tell you, um, there are people here that are medicating, being abused as children, terrible dads. Uh, their work situation, their terrible, whatever, and they're medicating it with alcohol. That doesn't solve a problem. It just masks a problem. And we're a culture that runs away from pain. But I want to say us men have to lead in this, that when there is pain, and trust me, I broke my, my knee, bro uh, uh, broke my ankle, uh, broken all, I messed up all these parts of my body, and they're trying to give me pain medication. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. And I can't imagine... Anybody that can justify, but I want to say to you is we have got to be a church and a group of people that start going through pain and helping people find solutions that actually last and matter. Amen. And I know that's a hard thing. And, I'm, and we're not here to judge people and to whatever, but I want to call you into something tougher than maybe you chose. So if you're here today and you're on pain medication, let me guess, you're probably secretively getting high on pain medication to numb your stuff down, but you're high all the time. And it's not right. And at some point, you got to try to do something different. Because let me tell you, as a pastor, all the time people are getting divorced and bad things are happening. And, and let me read a verse to you just to, you know, just to kind of throw this in here. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. You say, I can do everything. Everything is not good for you. I say I can do everything, but not everything is beneficial. Guys, I just, my prayer, my prayer, you go through pain, call me up, call Ross up, call someone, how, how should I go through this? Don't live your life in the dark. Life is a team sport, being a Christian is a team sport, and Flake will come pray tongues over you, and something crazy will happen, but, but let me tell you, it'll be awesome. And so I want to invite and encourage you guys. Can we give it up for being a church? Can we be a church that doesn't medicate problems, but brings them to God? Because we are a church full of sinners. Amen. And it's all right to say, I am messed up in this area of my life because uh, you'll hear from me or anybody else. Yeah, I've been with you. I know what it's like. Let's get forward on this. Let's move forward. So um, that's all I have to say about that. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, um, and Falake, just quickly, just explain forgiveness and repentance and how important it is for believers. Okay, we're a church that every time there's a message preached, we always ask for a rep response. We say, um, repent. And I find that it, we say the word repent, 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 and everybody is staring like, yeah, yeah, I'm repenting, but half of us don't know what repentance really means. You see, the true gospel of the kingdom has a condition, and that condition is called repentance. First, what is that? First, you, we realize what sin is. You can't repent if you don't realize what sin is. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is missing the mark. And when, when the gospel of the kingdom is preached, the first thing we realize is, shoot, I'm living in rebellion. I'm living for myself. I'm not living the life that God has asked me to. So suddenly you recognize that that's what's happening. Then the next step is repentance. And repentance means I've changed my mind. Repentance means, God, I agree with you that I have missed the mark, but now I change my mind. I want to follow you. Matthew 3, 1 to 3, it says, um, in those days, John 
the Baptist came to, to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance is saying, Lord, I'm sorry, but you don't stop here. You now turn back to God. And some of us, we think repentance is, we're sorry we were caught in our sin. We're sorry about the consequences. But repentance is saying, no, God, I am wrong. And now I, I'm not going to stop here, but I'm going to turn back to you. That that is the meaning of repentance. And then in Matthew 3 and 6, this is the one that gets me. He says, and when they confessed their sin, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So the next thing after repentance is you confess. And that's where you talk to God. That's where you have the moment where you say, God, I have searched it and I'm not the one that's right. You're the one that's wrong, um, right and I'm the one that's wrong. After you agree that God is right and you're wrong and you've changed your mind, the next step after confessing is this, Matthew 3, 9 to 10, repentance have fruit. Don't just say to each other, we are safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. What the Bible is saying is, repentance have fruit. Tell me that you're struggling with gossip and the pastor preaches or you read the word of God and the Holy Spirit convicts you. The fruit is you do not gossip anymore. And if you say, oh Lord, I want to tithe, the Holy Spirit convicts you. You ask God for sorry. The fruit is you start tithing. Every time that we repent of something, we ask God to help us as the Holy Spirit helps us. People look at you and say, wow, there's a change in your life. That is the fruit of repentance. Many people say prayer, God forgive me, I'm giving you my life. And you see them 10 years from that, they're still the same old person, doing the same old things. And I believe that uh, Jesus that could not change you, maybe he did not save you. Because true repentance has fruit that follows us every day. And repentance is not a one-time thing. Every time I read the Bible, I am convicted. Last week, Daniel spoke about the Bible. I was convicted. You know what happened this week? I said, God, help me get into the Bible. Bible more and more and the Holy Spirit will wake me up in the morning get in the Bible and I'm falling more in love with it everything we we hear every day don't come here and say I gave my life to Jesus 10 years ago and I've repented for the rest of my life it is every day as you read the word of God the Holy Spirit convicts you and after he convicts you you ask for forgiveness you confess your sin you invite him to help you in that area and make Jesus the Lord of your life in that area and the final question I have for you, Danny, I know we're running out of time. We need a piano person. That yeah. helps. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the final question is, here we are with the big ball here that is blue and it's baptism time. Water baptism. And a lot of people wonder, why do we get baptized? Why should we get baptized? And, and you have a crazy baptism story. And I, I would like the church to know that you didn't just wake up, become a pastor, and you got baptized. Can you tell us why you got baptized and the importance of being baptized? Well, I actually got baptized, uh, I think, four years ago, five years ago. I was a past four, five. I was a pastor for about eight years. And my parents never pushed me into getting baptized. My parents baptized people all the time, and I'd just watch it. <laughs> And they never once said, do you want to get baptized? Because they wanted me to make that choice myself. That's why I don't want to see any children getting baptized that don't make this decision themselves. I want to see them say, I want to get baptized because I love Jesus. Well, um, we went to this conference, and I was a youth pastor. We took all these kids to this Jenna Leash conference, and this girl at the end of the conference who wanted a miracle in her life fell over, started screaming, yeah, yeah, you know, and just like, and I don't know what to do. I grew up in the Nazarene church, you know, like, pff, we don't have a clue. What, she's crazy, you know, <laughs> or demon possessed, but we don't believe in that. And honestly, I didn't believe in that. And so as I'm watching this girl go crazy, like, we're at a Pentecostal church. I'm like, can you help her? And they're like, oh, is she possessed? I'm like, you're Pentecostal, help her. <laughs> and seriously, finally, I just started praying for her, and these other people came around, and, they, and I just started praying for her, and they didn't know what to do. They are freaking out, and I was just like, Lord, if there's, if there's light, there's darkness, and this is darkness, and so I pray against it, and I ask you to release whatever this is, and instantly, she just went limp, 
And then she was like, what, what? And she's like covered in sweat. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it doesn't scare me at all. And so I call my wife. I'm like, Jess, we had a girl fall over. I think she's possessed. Jess goes, oh my gosh, have her come over. Does she feel like something's grabbing her stomach? And I go, what? So I ask her, I'm like, is something grabbing your stomach? And she goes, yeah, something's, I feel a hand in my stomach squeezing my stomach. And, and she's throwing, like, having a problem not throwing up. And I'm like, this is cool. This is crazy. She gets to our house. I, I know this, you're like, how does this have to do with baptism? I'm getting there. So we get to, get to the house. And she goes into the bathroom, and she starts screaming like, I got it. and Jess goes, in the name of Jesus, be quiet. And she goes, boom. And I'm like, and Jess comes out, and she goes, oh, my gosh. I'm so scared. She is. And I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> to this day, like, I am not afraid of demons, because if there's a demon, the Bible says that no darkness is is dark enough to, to, to cast out all the light. Like, there's more light than darkness. I mean, Jesus is everywhere. I'm sick of people blaming all of their problems on being spiritually attacked. God is everywhere. Just go after him with all your heart. Watch what happens. And, and so she falls over, and so we ended up... Uh, I, I hate to even bring this up because I know I hate deliverance, but we ended up casting demons out of this girl. I know it sounds crazy. I don't care what you believe. This is my life story. Um, for five hours, at one point, she was choking herself, strangling herself. We casted the demon of shopping out. Dude, just go look it up. I'm just, it's just the weirdest dumb stuff. But I'm telling you, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. And this girl is actually going to be here this week, just to let you know. So if you don't believe me, talk to her. She got her life changed. And we're all done. And it was like, the demons hated me. They didn't care about Jess as much. But I kept turning the worship music up and like, turn it off through this girl. And they would scream in a different voice. And I'd turn it up more. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> so when the night was all over, this girl just snaps out of it. And she's like, what? What? And I was like, five hours. Like, we're wiped out. <laughs> you tried to choke her. I, I know people don't believe this. Whatever. And so... The next day at church, they're having a baptism. And I remember just that night, that, that day, just praying and just saying, God, if I can have something like that in me, like, I, will, I don't, <laughs> I believe that there's another world that I can't see. And, and no one can talk me out of that anymore. And so I stood in the back of the church line of 200 people getting baptized. I'm not kidding. Our church baptized people like crazy. I stood in back and they kept asking me, who are you baptizing? And I'm like, I'm getting baptized, but the truth is I didn't care what anybody thought. And I didn't stand in front. They wanted to make a big deal because we're a mega church. I stood in the back and I got baptized. I think, I don't know if they have a video. It might be next. It might be next to you. Yeah. Okay, it's right here. I stood in the back line. This is our pastor. Speaks his book at Hillsong every year. Get in, my big black friend, Octavian. I told him to slam me and hit me in the bottom of the pool. You don't have to play the sound, but all that to say, I got baptized, and I was standing in line crying, and I was just standing there going, God, do something in my life to protect me and my family from that. Whatever I saw, whatever that was, sure enough, right after that, our entire youth team went through deliverance. We've been taking people through deliverance. We had a lady downstairs slither like a snake yelling Jailzebub. It was so weird. And I, I just want to say this. I got baptized because it says, and I know this because I grew up in a church. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And for me, when I got baptized, it was like Jesus himself anointing my entire body. And it was publicly saying, I want to, I want to play for the lights team. Because there is a dark team, but it's going to lose. So I want to play for the lights team. And so if you're here today and you've never been baptized and you're sitting next to your wife and you've been a believer, who cares? The gospel is messy. And we are stubborn. We baptized at our church a guy that was, what, 80 years old? And so would you all just bow your heads for a sec? I'm going to do an easy call for you. I'm going to let God convict you. If you're here, we're going to baptize people. 
If you've given your life to Jesus or you would like to give your life to Jesus, you can get baptized. What happens in the water is something super spiritual. And it's also public. Jesus, right now, I just ask that you flow in here, God. Thank you, Jesus, for each member that is here, Lord. Thank you for a church that is not strapped down to a bunch of other people's opinions or beliefs or some denomination that has walked away from your truth. God, we are just here strictly to go after you with all our heart. Father, thank you that we can invite people to get baptized and they can make a choice for you and that no one can sit there going, oh, she's getting baptized. Like, we all need a Savior, Jesus. We all need you. Father, thank you right now for the opportunity to be a church that leads people the way you asked us to do it. Father, right now, I just pray for a radical night. I pray for radical baptisms. Father, I pray for this place to erupt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So right now, Daniel says that baptism, it's, it's not only that, but it's a command. Jesus Christ himself got baptized. He was not a sinner, but he came to identify with us. So if you're here, we're going to transition into baptism right now. I'm going to have somebody come pick the table and the chair so that the worship team can come back on the stage. So you've heard the, the message. Another thing I want to do while we prepare for baptism, I want to make an altar call. Daniel said it many times. He said, why do we need a savior? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. There's no other truth but Jesus. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But that's why he came. And I told you about repentance. Repentance is saying, God, I agree. I have missed the mark. But I want to confess that I agree with you. And I want to give you my life today. I want to follow you. So I'm going to have all eyes closed right now. If you're in here in this moment... And you've not given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or you have given your life, but you have no fruit of repentance. You're playing the religious game. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Today is what we know. But I want to say this to you. There is no other way. There's no other life. It's only Jesus that can save. And if you're in here and you want to give your life to Jesus, wherever you are, can you put your hands up? See your hand. Who else wants 